And the Oscar goes to... Writer Robert Penn Warren would go to his grave claiming his 1946 Pulitzer Prize winning novel All the King's Men was not based on the life of Louisiana Governor and 1930 Senator Huey Long. Long was a populist who spoke out against corruption, the rich, and banks. In 1934, he created the Cheryl Wealth Program, which proposed wealth redistribution in favor of decreasing poverty during the Great Depression. Long also pushed for federal spending on old age pensions, public works, schools, and colleges. During Long's time in power, he saw an end to rural isolation with the creation of massive highways and bridge construction. Hospitals and education institutions were also expanded and students were given free textbooks. Long's history was far from spotless, though. He was not beyond taking forceful action to get what he wanted, and after he became senator, he remained influential and inappropriately involved in state politics. He's remained a divisive figure in Louisiana's political history, with some calling him a dictator and others a demagogue. It is this life and political career that many readers and interpreters of Warren's novel say sounds an awful lot like the character of Willie Stark, the backwater politician who speaks for honesty, representing the people, and for many similar programs that Long fought for in real life. They're afraid of the truth, and the truth is this. They're trying to steal your money. Yeah, I said steal. The county commissioners rejected the low bid on the schoolhouse. Why? Well, they'll tell you their reason is the job will be done better. The county commissioners would have you believe that they're interested in public welfare. They're interested in welfare, sure, but it's their own. Played by Broderick Crawford in this 1949 movie adaption, Stark's rise to power is flawed as the idealistic man quickly becomes corrupt. He receives funds from the same people who supported the previous corrupt state leaders, he digs up dirt on everyone he can, he suppresses and controls the press, he covers up anything that could harm his career, and he's willing to do anything to reach his means. Helping him are a team of supporters. Among them, reporter Jack Burden, played by John Ireland in an Oscar-nominated performance, who starts off covering Stark for a series of stories before he gets caught up in the campaign and eventually finds himself digging up dirt for Willie. Another member of Stark's team is his secretary, Sandy Burke, played by Mercedes McCambridge, who won Best Supporting Actress for this, her first ever film role. While she works for, supports, and even cares for Willie, Sandy's cynical and frank attitude towards him is always on display, such as this moment when she reveals that Willie, who's left his wife Lucy but not divorced her, may be romantically involved with Jack's girlfriend. Willie's got big ideas, Jack. What do you mean? A girl like that could be a governor's wife or even a president. What are you talking about? He ditched Lucy, he ditched me, and he'll ditch you. Answer me. He'll ditch everybody in the whole world because that's what Willie wants. Whether or not it was consciously done, one of the great decisions of director and screenwriter Robert Rawson was his choice to not cast huge stars in the leading and supporting roles. True, he did originally offer the part of Willie Stark to John Wayne, who turned down the part due to the script being unpatriotic in his eyes, but his eventual casting of Crawford and the rest of the cast was the right decision. Actors who lack the widespread recognition of a John Wayne make the film more immersive because I'm not thinking that's John Wayne playing a corrupt politician, but oh look, a corrupt politician. The same logic was behind the casting of Christopher Reeve and Superman. They didn't want audiences to watch a movie star playing the superhero. They wanted people to see Superman on the screen. It's this approach that allowed me to get more wrapped up in the story than I might have if name actors had been given the parts. Rawson added to the sense of reality by giving some speaking parts to locals in one of the small towns he was shooting in, the director often filming so-called rehearsals in order to capture spontaneity. I couldn't help but also notice the movie doesn't have the feeling of a studio picture, and that it didn't look like the typical, mostly studio-bound films of the period. It was shot outside and in various local residents in California, a rarity for the time. The cinematography and camera work, while still very much in the mold of other 1940s movies, had the feel of a documentary at certain points with its occasional handheld shots and its avoidance of glamorous, soft-focused close-ups. While we're talking about cinematography, a yeah, slight detour. All the Keen's Men sees an end to the 1940s. The only reason I mention that is because with it being shot in black and white, it makes the 1940s the only decade of the Oscars to not feature even a frame of color in any of its Best Picture winners. The 1930s had gone off the wind, obviously, and if you remember my Missed Opportunities video, a musical sequence in the 1929 film The Broadway Melody, while not only available in black and white, was originally shot in two-strip Technicolor. Starting with the 1950s, color films would become more prevalent until they eventually overcame black and white almost entirely. Anyway, All the King's Men doesn't have the production or visual style of a film like Gentleman's Agreement or The Best Years of Our Lives. It's more akin to some of the films of the 50s, like later Best Picture winner On the Waterfront, which utilized real locations due to a lack of studio space in New York. This leads to All the King's Men having more hard-edged, tactile quality, which makes the film's story of political corruption all the more effective, relatable, and infuriating than it might have if it took place in shiny, clean sets on Columbia's back lots because it feels like you're watching a real-life incident. And make no mistake, this is a frustrating and emotionally charged movie. 
Corruption in politics has been around since politics began. It's an unfortunate fact of life. What all the King's men shows is even those with good intentions could go down a morally questionable road. Crawford, who won Best Actor for this part, gives us that perfectly. While he's not as innocent and idealistic as I would have preferred him to be at the film's start, you can see the honorable man that wants to do good by his community and weed out those who are abusing their power. Like in this scene where he's telling the people how he grew up wanting to change things for himself and those like him. But something came to him on the way. How he could do nothing for himself without the help of the people, that's what came to him. And it also came to him with the powerful force of God's own lightning back in his home county when the school building collapsed because it was built of politics, rotten brick. It killed and mangled a dozen kids. But you know that story. The people were his friends because he fought that rotten brick. And some of the politicians down in the city, they knew that. So they rode up to his house in a big, fine, shiny car and said us how they wanted him to run for governor. Sadie, he's wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. And he swatted it. He looked in his heart and he thought in all humility how he'd like to try and change things. He was just a country boy who thought that even the plainest, poorest man can be governor if his fellow citizens find he's got the stuff for the job. His speeches and sentiment don't feel ungenuine, and the writing isn't overblown Hollywood stuff, but subtle and believable. The corrupt Stark is as equally convincing, the key being understatement instead of melodramatic, twirling mustache villainy. Like when the state's attorney hands in his resignation after too many dirty tricks, deals, and actions from Stark. It took you a long time to make up your mind, Judge. A long time. What made you take such a long time? wasn't sure. Now you are. I'll tell you what you are. You were scared. You sat in that big easy chair of yours for 30 years and played at being a judge. Then all of a sudden I came along and put a bat in your head and I said, go ahead, judge, start swinging. And you did and you had a wonderful time, but now you're scared. You don't want to get your hands dirty. You want to pick up the marbles, but you don't want to get your hands dirty. Look at my whole program, judge. How do you think I put that across? If there's one bad thing about Crawford's betrayal, it's that Stark's journey from reputable to immoral is a little too quick. Stark going for the dirty methods a bit too soon and easily. All our main characters are susceptible to this convincing man, and we're witness to a few effective, tragic tales of downfall as our main characters lose their moral compasses. In fact, none of our characters are all that likable. This may not be appealing to some. Personally, they're not the types of characters I would want to spend hours and hours of my time watching, but in small doses, I can manage. One reason I can tolerate it is because in Willie's and Jack's case, it shows how easily politicians and those that ate them can transform themselves into the very things they were fighting against, all the while still insisting they're nothing like those who preceded them. To complain for just a second again, though, John Ireland's Jack is rather bland and wooden when our story begins. And what do you want me to do? Oh, Jack, Jack, you haven't been sure. You've gone from one thing to the other. You're at law school, and now this job is a reporter. You're afraid I can't make a living? Oh, no, Jack, it isn't that. I don't care about the money. It's just that I, I want you to be something. What is it you want me to be? I don't know. It's just that I want you to be, to do something important. Like your father? All right, I'll run for governor. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I said that. It's not until we get well into our tale, when Jack has been performing disreputable acts for a while, that I began to care about his character. It wasn't just wishing I could see what Stark was up to. At one point, Jack tells Willie, who's struggling to connect with the people through his speeches, to make the people laugh, make them cry, and make them mad, even if it's at him. Because that'll stir them up and make them want to come back for more. While well, the King's Men certainly doesn't make you laugh, but it can make you weep and make you furious over the sometimes broken political system. Bringing light to those flaws is just as important today as it was in 1949, and it will certainly bring you back to all the King's Men time and again.